Tonight, we're going to be diving deeper into Parallax and 2.5D. We're going to do a quick recap and then jump right into tonight. I want everybody to uh, just watch this part. Because it's just recap. Here is a shape layer. And these are my switches. Remember, if you see this mode, you're in modes. You need to be in switches. And for whatever layer or layers you want to 3D enable, you just click on the square cube for that layer. Now it's two and a half D. And a reminder when you got two and a half D, you can now move back and forward towards the camera. Plus, you've got a whole new system of options for your rotation that are very useful in design. The anchor point turns into a gizmo. I'm going to move the gizmo with the pan behind tool. You know what? Let me delete that square. It's not letting me move the gizmo. Let me try again. And I'll move the anchor point first. Okay, so it's right there. Now I 3D enable it, and there's my gizmo. So we can now rotate on any of the three axes we choose, which gives you far more flexibility as an animator. Plus it allows you to add in some perspective as well. So it's very, very useful to work in 2.5D to get a deeper scene. All right, so I'm going to delete this square. And now we're going to dive into the new stuff with 2.5D slash 3D. So everyone just put your anchor point. We'll just do the bottom middle and 3D enable this layer. We're gonna just use two squares so that you can see what's going on. Make one red and one green. So I'll call this one red, so there's no confusion. Command D or Shift D to duplicate, hit enter to rename a layer. And I'm going to spread these out a little bit in 3D space. Put blue at the front. Okay. Now with your gizmos, you'll see as I'm hovering over, I get this red ring. That's for rotate. This is for position. And there's one for scale as well. I'm going to go to the Y, the green line, to move it straight down a little bit. Okay, so this is the new stuff coming up. We're going to go layer, new, add camera. And I'm just going to do 15 millimeter. Uh, the wider the lens, the, the smaller the lens, the wider, so you'll see more horizontally. And it causes a little bit of a distortion as it gets closer to the edges. The more zoomed you have, it'll stretch the image and be a little bit closer. So I'll just do 15 for this. Click OK. All right, so I got the camera in the scene. I can't really see anything yet. That's what these three buttons are for up here. This one is for orbiting and rotating the camera. This one is for panning and tilting. And this one is for zooming back and forth. And there's some drop downs as well. So I'm going to zoom back out. Since I can't see my other square, I'm going to zoom out with the zoom right here. If you click and drag up or down, you'll zoom in or out. Now I can see both of them. So this is to move back and forth in your scene zooming in and out in 3D space. The orbit, if I hold down shift, it'll orbit around only the X axes. Same thing if I hold down shift and go up or down, that's a, going to orbit 
only on that axis. Pan, pan, I'm gonna hold down shift and move side to side. That moves from side to side. If I hold down shift and go up and down, that's a tilt. So tilt is tilting the camera up or down. Pan is moving it side to side. And then of course you can rotate it as you want. You don't have to constrain it to an axis if you don't want to. It's up to you as the designer. And remember, the fewer keyframes you put for your camera motion, the smoother it's going to be. So that's adding a camera into your 3D scene. You can also add lights. Everything new that you add can be added from layer new. It's all right there. I'm going to add a light. And I'm going to make it white. And I'll just keep these settings, cone angle 180, cone feather 100, inverse squared clamp for the fall off. The radius will be how wide it's casting. Cast shadows, I'm gonna turn on. Your diffusion is going to be how soft the shadow will be. So right now you can see that, let me zoom out a little bit. I've got to move that spotlight so that I can see better. So let's try making it a little brighter. And let me take a look at this from the side real quick. And I'll explain how I did that in a second. Okay, so that's for the red. This is my light. This is what it's pointing at. Okay, good. We'll be diving into, these are your different views you can get to once you've got a camera in the scene. Okay, now I can see the light affecting the square. Now the blue square we're not seeing, but that's okay. So I'm gonna delete this scene, this light. That's how I added that one in. Where the, oh, there's the blue square. That's why we didn't see it. Okay, so let me move that back in the scene a little bit. So I'm gonna add one more light to the scene. And instead of a spotlight, here's your drop down. I'm gonna choose ambient and an ambient light will light up the whole scene. Now I'm gonna give it a color. I'm gonna make it, uh, let's say green. And watch what happens. Now I'm starting to see that square. Let's make it yellow. See, now you can see it on the blue. The blue looks orange because I tinted the ambient light in the scene. And this is getting more orange as well. So you can use color on your lights to affect elements in your scenes. So whenever you want to add a new light, you can just go into layer, new, and then add it from there and use the drop down to change the type of light it is. I'm going to delete these lights just so I have less in my timeline here. And a quick reminder, parallax, when things are spread out on the Z space, like they are here, I can even go back a bit. Let me deselect. As I move the camera, I get the parallax effect. Now I'm going to zoom in a bit and then position this over here. I'm gonna tilt well, I'm gonna pan across the screen and watch what happens. The blue looks like it's moving faster because it's closer to the camera. So let me move this back. The further something is away from the camera, the slower it looks to be moving. And the closer it is to the camera, the faster it appears to be moving. Okay. And parallax, it's just changing the relation of the shapes as you zoom in and out or move the camera. You can still move stuff around, but this these spatial relations will become distorted 
as the camera moves through your scene. So with the camera, I'm going to show you a few features of the camera. You can enable depth of field, and you can zoom in and out based right there. The aperture will be, you know, how blurry things become. And again, anything with the stopwatch can be keyframe animated. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a new scene. Cloud did not download. OK, it's fine. Put in my scene, scale it up. When you're working with cameras, you've got to make sure. Oh, first, let me 3D enable it. There we go. Let's do 35 millimeter. Enable depth of field is on. Okay, fine. All right. So now my camera, I'm going to move a little bit. You're going to notice this tree is no longer filling up the scene at this angle. So stay aware of that. Scale things up. And if something's supposed to fill the frame, like your whole composition, you're going to need to scale it up in order to ensure that that happens. So you see how we can create a different look by adding a little bit of perspective to an image that's not 3D. There's another benefit, like I said, adding in perspective. with 3D and cameras. And I could use the gizmos to move it around. I think this would be scale. No, nope, that's, that'll be for moving. This should be, let me take a closer look real fast. Yeah, this square. The square on the gizmo is for scale. The arrow is for moves. That's position. The square is scale. And the ring is for rotation. So you've really got to zoom in to see it, which is not very effective. It's usually faster and easier to do it with P, S, R, and not really T because that's not going to be affected. But P, S, and R will definitely help you. And like I said, you could also rotate whatever axes you want down there. So if I were able to get transparent images, we could make a more complex scene. And just a reminder, the spotlight will shine on. Oh, second. I'm going to add a square here. 3D enable it. And I'll add a spotlight. Spotlight's going to shine in an area like a spotlight would. And an ambient light will shine on the whole composition like the sun would. So if I make this blue, you're seeing that I'm now going to get two different colors from where those lights are interacting, just like blending modes. That green now gets more of a blue cast to it. And again, anything with the stopwatch can be animated. So last class, I showed you alpha mats and trim paths to draw on a shape, I mean a letter. This time, I'm going to go a little bit deeper into the pen tool. So I'm going to draw an M shape with my pen tool. I'm going to give it no fill and a stroke. If 
gonna make it a little more narrow. All right. So anything you wanna add to a shape layer, you have to have your arrow tool selected and you can go to add to get there. There's also all your contents down in here. I'm gonna go down to the stroke. We covered butt caps. So I'm gonna make this round and you see the ends changed. Now watch my corners when I change my joins. See, that's the difference where you've got your caps at the end and then the joins. And remember, plus you could add dashes if you want. You could also animate them. The offset will animate them around like such. So I can just click here, and then move forward in time. Like that. Using dashes and offset and things like that are fast ways of getting some more complex animations, like making something look like a film strip that's moving around. Taper. You can get thick and thin to where your lines start and end. And don't forget, you could also animate that because it's got a stopwatch. You can also ease that amount to get whatever type of look you want. There's also wave. So now I'm getting a bunch of sine waves in there. The wavelength. If I have a smaller number, let's try that's 36 and let's see what five looks like. Let's try a hundred. Let me lower that back down to five and take a look at it. It looks like five might be too small. So I'll do 40. Let's try 100. Okay, now this time, the phase I'm going to animate. I'm going to Alt or Option click on there, and I'm going to type in an expression time with an asterisk, and let's try 300. And remember, you got to click out of a field for the expression. See, like such. So you can add a lot of life and interest to your shape layers by diving in to the settings for each one to get your own custom looks. All right. I'm going to go back to my tree. So last week we did alpha mats and I'm going to do a quick recap on masks now. So to make a mask, you have to have the layer selected and you can use any shape tool or the pen tool. I'm just gonna make a square. Add what's inside the mask will be shown. Subtract what's the shape that you made will be removed. So that's the difference between add and subtract. Remember, this is how you see your alpha, the negative space. So I'm gonna set that one to subtract. And I'm going to draw another mask. I'm going to make it an oval. And this time I'm going to do intersect. I'm getting a completely different look. That's none. Intersect would be that. Let me try intersect for here. See? 
you do add, you can get all sorts of different looks by playing around with those. And if I click inverted, I'm going to get a whole nother set of options as well for my mask. Let me delete that second one, go back to here. I'm going to dive a little bit deeper into the mask settings now. I'm going to delete this mask. And I'm going to draw a mask instead. I'm just going to do like a little organic shape. Like that. So that's going to be my mask now. Remember, the layer has to be selected. You can animate a mask path if you need to. And it's the same. I'm going to click off the grid so you can see a little better. I'm holding down Shift to choose the point. It's the same as a shape path. You can animate the path points or you can animate the Bezier curve handles, or you can do both. It's whatever you need to get the effect that you want. See, there you see a change over time. In addition, with masks, you can feather them right here. The higher the number you feather, the more of a gradation you're going to get. See, so I've got a nice soft look there. That's your mask feather. Remember, anything with the stopwatch can be animated. Mask expansion is an interesting one. I'll demonstrate. I'm going to go in a positive direction first, like that. And then I'll go in a negative direction, like such. You can use this for getting your own custom transitions or to call attention to a certain spot of your scene. And this is something I want you to notice. When you feather something in your mask, it feathers every side equally. So I'm going to delete that. I'll keep this. Let me get rid of the feather. And I'll get rid of this mask expansion. So if I feather this every side, feathers equally. Now, since I drew this with the pen tool and I go down to the pen tool, there's now a new feature, mask feather tool. And what you do is you click and you add points to wherever you want. I can now move that point and it's feathering along that edge. So by adding a point here, I've got a soft feather going on here that's going to stop there. The further away I move, the more feathering I get. And I also expand the mask a little bit more. Let's experiment with this right here. See, that's overriding the mask feather tool. Let me move this mask a little bit. So if you need to have full control over your mask, the mask feather tool is the way to do it by adding extra points so that you can feather exactly where you need to and then add points to lock down where you don't want more feathering. And you can move those points around as need be to get the exact look you want. You won't be able to get that effect with the mask feather because that's gonna uniformly feather everything the same amount. All right, and I have all this stuff pre-recorded, week four, lecture one. Now let's go over parenting a little deeper. So I'm going to make a rectangle, and some people have already been using parenting but like I said, i have go get to everything. I just show people some stuff ahead of time to help them with their animations. Okay, so I have some text and a shape layer. I'm gonna parent my text to the shape layer using the pick whip, or you could use the drop down menu. So now anything I do to the shape layer 
happens to the text as well. They're staying together. That's very important to know. That's why we do parenting in character rigs like the forearm to the wrist to the hand to keep the arm together, parent the arm to the torso, things like that. But watch what happens when I do the opacity on the shape layer. That did not work, okay? If I wanted to get the opacity to work along with all the other stuff, I would have to alt or option click on the opacity to get an expression and then use my pick whip inside the expression, not the one over here, the expression pick whip. And let me set to that opacity. So now let's see what happens. Now it's all working together. So that's how you fix an opacity, pick whip, parenting issue. And then the rest of this will work. So if I add an expression for wiggle in here, let's say two comma 50. And then for my position, I add a wiggle, do the same wiggle. Click out of the expression. Uh, I'll do scale. Same expression. I really could have copied and pasted it, but now lastly, this should work because I did this expression. I'm going to put a wiggle in the opacity to get a flickering look. Let's try two comma 200. Now I'm going to hit the space bar and see if it follows all of this together now. Yep, see now it works. The fact that I put that expression on the text layer so that the opacity matches the opacity changes of the shape layer. Now all of these expressions are working together properly to get a little bit of randomness. And we're almost done. The last thing I'm covering is mats, which I touched on earlier loosely. But like I said, I teach people some things ahead of time so that they can get their projects done on time. I'm going to put my photo back in. So we covered masking. And now I'm going to do mats. If you have nothing selected and you're using the pen tool or the shape tool, you're going to get a new shape layer. And I'm just going to use a square for this demonstration. I want to be in my modes for working with mats. These are my switches. I click here to go to my modes. Here's my layer. That's going to be the mat. Remember the expression, you put a mask over your face, like a Halloween mask goes on top of your face. So this is going to be the shape on top. This is what's below. On the shape below, I go over to my track mat and I choose alpha mat. So what's ever in that shape will be shown. And if you animate this and you move it around, that's what's going to happen. Okay. And we're going to be covering that next week with more advanced trouble solving. So that's a mat. Now I'm going to show you some new things with mats. You know, I'm going to put that farce back down, scale back up. OK, I'm going to draw a square again. But this time, I'm going to give it a gradient fill like this. I'm still in my modes. And instead of an alpha mat, I'm going to show you a new one now. I'm going to click on Luma mat. Same spot as that. And what we see is white is see-through and black is not. It's uh, fully 
opaque. So if I adjust my gradient, by going, going down, going to edit gradient. You'll see the transparency change. Like such. Luma mats are very handy to have. If you ever want some tonation, they're great for effects. Alpha mats are based off of shapes and alpha. Luma mats are based off of grayscale values. And we're back here. Now, I'm going to show you one more type of mat. Remember, it's the golden rule of mats is it's one layer revealing one layer. I'm going to demonstrate what that means. I'm going to do a solid fill. So I'm going to put a square here and deselect. I'll add a circle, deselect, and some text, okay? If I want all of this to be my alpha mat, I need one layer revealing one layer. I want these three layers revealing the photo behind here. So I gotta get rid of that track mat, I mean the Lua mat. So the solution for that if you've got multiple layers making up your alpha mat, select all of those layers that are going to be your alpha mat, right click and pre-compose and move all attributes. If there's any animation on here, it'll stay there. Because remember, it's one layer revealing one layer. Same thing if I had multiple layers that I wanted to be what was revealed, I would pre-compose those together. So now I can go here, set my alpha mat, and all those various shapes, since they're one layer, because I pre-composed them, are revealing the one layer below them. That's a little bit deeper look into alpha mats and problem solving them. Now here's the last new mat, and then we're done the new stuff for tonight. The last mat is an alpha invert. And I'll show you what that means. Get rid of this alpha mat on that layer. Okay. I'm going to put this covering that text. If this were an alpha mat, it would reveal the text because it's covering the text. Okay, so I'm going to show that again. Now I'm going to put it, let me animate the text. I'm going to work backwards here. I'm going to put it above. So it drops down like such. Now I'm going to set my track mat. I mean my alpha mat. When it's an alpha mat, what's inside that box is revealed. Okay? That's the alpha mat. I'm going to change that shape to alpha inverted. And now where the shape is not is what you're seeing. So it's showing the opposite of it. So now it's disappearing as it goes into that shape. Sometimes you'll need to use an alpha invert when you've got tricky situations to get your scene working properly. So I'm going to delete that positioning. That's one use of an alpha invert, using the outside of a shape to reveal something or to hide it. Here's another use for an alpha Invert. I'm going to make a new solid. I'm going to make it black. And I'm going to put it below it. And watch what's going to happen. So I've got my text above, a shape layer, and then the forest. Okay, that's my layer stack. The solid shape layer, I'm going to set to alpha invert. Now I've got a cookie cutter effect. Okay, the top layer is being punched through the middle layer, revealing the layer below it. I'm going to hit S for scale. 
So I'll keep this up for a second. Hit here. And then fly through it by zooming up. Uh, nope, I'm going to get rid of that. I'm going to put my anchor point in the middle by holding down command and double clicking on the pan behind tool. All right, now my fly through will work. I'm going to click on my scale, move forward a couple seconds, zoom it up a lot. And you notice it's only the positive space that is revealing. So you've also got to plan that. So I can have this here. I can animate the position as well. So that I'm flying through the X. Put that towards the center. And let me slide that there. Fly completely through the X. screen and just a little bit more and it'll be completely through there I'm gonna go more than I need just to make sure that's the last time I've got to change things okay so this is sort of like the stranger things titles at the beginning of the show I had to move that uh, because there was no shape for me to fly through. So that would be a fly through. And also, here's the final thing of thinking things through as a motion designer. If the camera is pushing in here, then that means I should be zooming into the layer below it. So if my end scene right here, I'm going to do S for scale is that at the beginning, it should be zoomed out a little bit. So as the camera's pushing into it, we see the scene behind it zooming up. You just gotta be careful of your edges, like such. So that's why when companies do their logos and fly-throughs, they usually have a solid shape that they could easily fly into and not have to move things around. That's just one of the troubleshooting you'll have to do with alpha invert fly throughs. Okay, now I'm going to open up the file and I'll see if I can help you with the issue you're having. Okay, so I'm going to try parenting the cord to the headphone jack, which you already did. And I'm going to try and parent the headphone jack to the body. And now that's working. So this is reiterating what we covered at the beginning of the class with parenting. The order things are parented to is important when you're rigging things. Rigging a tape player, it's the same as rigging a body. The cord she drew is parented to the headphone jack so that they stay together. All I had to do was parent the headphone jack to the camera body to have it get that last little bit of life to it. Now let's see what happens when we go back to the main animation. Is that happening? Okay, and this is, okay, all right, all right, all right. I went to the wrong thing. That's still working. That's working, that looks great. Very playful, that's working. Okay, so this right here, let me hide that one. And it worked up until there, so let me try now it's back. Why does that keep flickering off and on?
oh, because it's not in, okay, that's what the problem is. It's only in pre-comps that are based off of this one right here. So all I have to do then is open up the other ones, paste that in, move it behind, and once more, because this is already parented, just parent the jack to the cassette body. I'm going to put it in here. We'll see if it needs to be there. Put it below. Same thing. Parent the jack to the body. So we've got that, we've got that, we've got that. We've got that, we've got that. And we've got it there. So let's go back to your main animation and try it again. See what happens. It's looking lovely. Good there. Perfect. All right. Loving that. So let me read the rest of your email, make sure I'm addressing everything. Okay. Uh, yeah, it looks like everything. So it was really just copy and pasting the cord into all your cut up comps. And then uh, parenting the headphone jack. I'm going to send you this file just so you've got it for reference. And don't forget, I hid this one. I clicked the eyeball icon. It's looking spectacular. I'm glad that was a fast, easy fix. Um, really loving this. And then we'll go talk more about that transition, which you seem to have pretty good. So let's, okay. Sorry, I don't have a mouse. I've got my trackpad. And what I like about this animation, um, it's rare, but you're helping me recover almost everything I did tonight because you've got such an advanced animation that it touches on a lot of things I spoke about. Um, I'm going to open up Canvas and I'll look for other people's emails in a second. I'm just going to do the last thing I want to show for this one. Uh, let's see. So... Okay, so Sarah, I got hers in Canvas and the other one. Dino. Okay, no problem. Got it. All right, so. It's just Sarah's, which is great for now. So. We talked about. Last, last lecture, we talked about bounding boxes. The bounding box for this comp is the size of the window. Okay? So I'm going to make a new composition. And I'm just going to call it, you know, MW Scene 2. So that when you open up my file, it makes sense. It's the same size as this comp. So I'm going to go to where your transition is and I'm going to add my scene to it right there. My scene's empty. And remember, if you hold down shift and drag, you can snap a layer to where the playhead is. So I'm going to do this just so you have a visual reference. And I'm going to add that image. Oh, let me scale it up. Now, bear in mind, I'm also going to put a color behind here so you can see that it's uh, a full scene. 
you would have your headphone jack or a cord or whatever reaching up to the person. So that's what my scene looks like. And I go here. So now we can see my scene. I'm going to put this. Let's try zero. Nope. Oh, OK, so we'll keep going up. Minus. <clears throat> Since my anchor point was in the center, minus 540 is that edge of the screen. I am going to, got that happening. I'm going to parent this, since you've already got some motion, I'm going to parent it to there. No, no, wait. What's moving? So, okay, it's this one down here. I'm going to parent it to that. I'll move my playhead, and look, it follows your scene perfectly. So once it comes down to about, let's say it's fully on the screen, I'll go forward to frame. Page up and page down will help you with that. I'm going to just split it there and unparent it. So now it's there. So it just follows it seamlessly. I put the comp at the edge of the top, as you can see. it's off the screen. It's right just off the screen. And when I parented it to the other image that was moving, they moved together. So that's your transition from one scene to the next. And you can do all your animating for this scene in that pre-comp that we've got right there. So I love it when there's questions and easy solutions that you can show visually. Hopefully that all makes sense. I'm going to put this on Google Drive for you right now. So you have it for reference. And I'm going to include that image, just that you've got it as well. You know, since you cut that pre-comp, we had to add the artwork into each cut and then just fix the parenting of the jack to the body. It's looking incredible. If anyone else has anything, that you want to show me, write me on Canvas. OK, wait a second. Yes, you have a great night too, Sarah. Thank you. And yeah, great. That one went through pretty fast. All right, great. Sorry that the chat's not working tonight. All right, so if anyone else has anything, email me in Canvas. And while I'm waiting, I will keep uh, entertaining myself. And uh, so since I dived a little bit more into shape layers tonight, I'm going to show you a little bit more ahead of uh, when we do cover this. I'm going to do a good old fashioned square. And last class, I used this effect, but I didn't go into it too much. Rough and edges. Now you'll notice this is the path. It shows or hides it. If you ever need to work on something more carefully and you that edge is in the way. So if I increase the border, you're going to see right away what this effect is doing. It's making it less computerized and more hand-drawn looking. And zero edge sharpness gives you a smoky look. Increasing the edge sharpness past one will give you a different look as well. The fractal influence, you see how that is impacting this? It can't go higher than one. Scale is the size of the fractal. So if I go for a smaller size, I've got more roughening edges happening. Whereas if I go for a larger one, I've got less of them. One for width, one for height, if you only want to put it in one direction. Now I'm going to give a little 
jump ahead when I'm talking about effects in After Effects. Because I've got some time to talk about it. Things you all come across a lot. This crosshair I showed you before. You click on it once, and then you can set it wherever you want it. So this will be where this effect is starting. Right there. So I'm going to click the stopwatch, go forward a little bit, and change that. So I could use my sliders now if I want to move it straight down. And you see the noise, or I should say you see the rough and edges moving in a downward position or a downward uh, animation. Evolution. We've got the full rotations and angle, just like our rotate in a layer, like if I hit R for rotate, I've got the same thing. The first one's full rotations. Second one is a specific angle. So a helpful thing, if you want this effect to keep moving, is to Alt or Option click and use that expression, time, then an asterisk, and then add a number. So I'm just going to do 200 and click out. So it's going to keep evolving and having the texture move even after I have those keyframes go away. The texture is still animating because of that expression, all right? So there's drop-down menus to give you different looks. You can have a color if you want. You can make it more spiky looking. It's really up to you. And you see when I change the border, sometimes you have to increase it to see more of the effect that you had. Like such. Now, since we've got some extra time in lab, I'm going to show you something uh, interesting because that's what I'm here for to fill time. All right, I'm gonna make a circle. And I'm not gonna give it a fill. I'll give it like a grayish color. And I'll make it a little less wide, there we go. Okay, this'll be my bike tire. Now I'm going to set the anchor point to the middle of it by command double clicking on the pan behind tool. It's right there. And I'm going to add a star and I'm going to line these up. So for that, I'm going to need the transform for the star in that layer. They're both on the same layer. And I'll line them up. There we go. So now I can go to my star, change the number of points to it, change the amount for the stroke, I could also adjust the inner and outer radius. Now I'm getting a bike wheel very easily, bike tire, okay? And I'm going to, do I need to move this a little bit more? What I need to do is I need to scale it up. So, no. So I'm gonna go to my transform for that shape, not the transform for the layer. And I can scale it up a little bit, like that. Perfect. That's my tire. So I've already got one tire drawn. Bike has two tires. I'm going to shifty duplicate it, move it, let's say about here. And I'll just do this the fast, lazy way. Use a rectangle.
and I'll put that there. And I'll put that there. We'll pretend this is the bike body. Okay, if I need to keep these layers separate, that's no problem. Or since it's a bike, I'm going to just pre-compose all these together. Select them, right click, pre-compose, I'll call it bike body. Move all attributes into new comp. So I've got the body and the tires, all right? Now, I'm going to parent the tires to the body. Let's test it out. I'm going to move it. It's all moving together. Great. Now I'm going to get experimental because that's what lab is all about. For the tires, I'm going to use the pick whip by rotation because I've got a pick whip here and a pick whip there. I'm going to drag the pick whip to the word position for the body of the bike. Now, when I move my bike, the tires are rotating as it moves. So, let's move the bike off the screen. Click my stopwatch, go from there to about here. Move it to the edge of the screen. Use my speed graph to easy ease these. Right click, keyframe assistant, easy ease. Click here to go to my speed graph. This looks like my, yes, yeah, speed graph, okay. We'll have it go slower as it gets to the end. So let's see what happens now. See, the wheels get slower in the rotation as it slows down. I'm gonna move this so we can see even more drastically. The farther and faster it's moving, the more it's rotating, just like it would realistically. That's another example of parenting. You've got pick whips for your stopwatches as well as for the layer. So by using the pick whip for the rotation stopwatch, I was able to parent the rotation to the position of the tires. All right. I am going to now hold down Alt or Option and get rid of that expression. Okay, now so that's a bicycle. Let me delete the bike body. And what I'm going to do next is if I were to do a train, let's try a tie rod going across here. So the train, as it moves, the rod moves up and down with the rotation. So let's think this through. So I'm going to get rid of that layer. Let's try a rod here. Let me get rid of my duplicate wheel. So there's that rod there. I'll call this rod. All right, now I'm going to put the anchor point at the center. We'll grab the rod and the tire. Make sure they line up with my align. There we go. Perfect. So this will be the rod. There's the tire. I'm going to parent the rod to the tire. I can use the drop down or the pick whip. So now I'm going to duplicate both of these. 
P for position. Wait a second, let's see what happened here. I'm going to drag both of them together so they stay together. Let me line those back up. I don't know why that one moved like that. It shouldn't have. There we go. So now, okay, they're parented together. Great. So I've got two rods, two tires. The rods are parented to the tires. And as the tires rotate, the rod moves with it. I'm going to use the pen tool next, nothing selected. I'm going to click on the rods and just draw a straight line like that. And I'll call this crossbar. There's my crossbar. And I'm going to give it no fill, make it a little thicker so we can see it more easily. And I'll change the color so we can see it more easily too. So now you can see each part of it. Okay, as the tires will rotate, let me put the uh, anchor point at the middle of the crossbar. There we go, okay, great. As these tires rotate, the rods are gonna move around. This needs to stay connected to the rods. The crossbar needs to stay collect connected to that. So since I drew this with the pen tool, that means I can now go to window. I showed you this earlier. Create nulls from paths. Nulls are invisible objects that don't render that you can use for situations such like this. I'm going to do points follow nulls. Oh, that's right. I got to select them first. What that means is I got to open up the path, stopwatch, and click on the word path for this to work. Like that, I've clicked on the word path. Paths follow nulls. Okay, that's there. And now there's my nulls. So I've got two of them. Let's name them. This is tire two. Let me lower this. And this will be tire one. So tire one, here's tire one. I'm going to parent this null to the rod for tire one. Now I'm going to parent this null to the rod for tire two. The rods are parented to the tires. So as the tires rotate, the blue rods will spin around with them. I parented the null path points of the crossbar to the rods so that they will stay with that rod. It should stay with that. So now, since we're doing a train, we'll pretend that this is our train right here, that shape right there. I'll call it train body. Okay, perfect. I'm going to parent the tires to the train So as the train moves, the tires move. Now I'm going to parent the rotation. Remember, here's the pick whip for the rotation. There's the pick whip for the layer. The pick whip of the rotation to the train for there. Same thing here. So what should work is as this moves, yep, now it's all coming together. So I'm going to just have this go back and forth on the screen. There to there. And let's ease those. Go to our speed graph. Slow into it.
and let's make sure it works. Yep. So the tires rotation is parented to the position of the train body. The blue bars that show the wheel spinning around are parented to the tire. So as the tire spins, that blue bar spins with it. The red crossbar, I had to create nulls so that it stays to where the blue bars are. That's how you get it to follow that rotation. And with that nulls follow windows, uh, that window nulls follow path or whatever, that's how I got all of this to work like that. So there is a reason for learning parenting and figuring out parenting order to get more complex animations and uh, study it. Since I got a little bit more time, I'm going to save this. So that's comp one. I'll call this train. Bike body. Do I still have the bike body? Okay. So I don't have the tires for that. But the bike body still follows all the same stuff. So I'll get rid of that. Okay. So I'm going to call this one Nulls Paths. And I'm going to draw a squiggly line with multiple path points. Okay, I've got like six or seven of them. Contents, shape, path, click on the word path. I'm going to go window, create nulls from paths. For the train, we did points follow nulls. So for each point, it creates a null. When you move the null, it'll move the path point. I'll demonstrate that again. So this null right here, if I position it and move it, the path point moves with it. Okay, so I'm going to hit undo. That's what the first one does. The second one nulls follow points. It's the opposite. If I get my path and I move the point, the null moves with it, okay? So that's what that one does. The last one, trace path. I'm gonna click on there. The null will follow the path. So, you can have it loop or not loop. I'm going to turn off loop. I'm going to hide the path. And I'm going to draw a star. Like such. Basically, put the anchor point in the center of it. I'm going to parent the star. I mean, label this a star. I'll parent the star to the null. And now the star is going to move along the path. I can move this even more so by let's try. I right clicked on the star in the transform that pops up from the right click. I'm going to choose auto orient and I'm going to orient along path. So what's going to happen now is as the star moves. It's going to rotate a little bit as it goes along the path. There we go. Now it's doing it better. Like that.
So those are the three different ways of using that expression. And I'm going to do three points, shoulder, elbow, wrist, okay? Arm, here we go. And I'm going to go down to my stroke. I'm going to round this out. So now I've got a cartoony look. Okay. There's my arm. All right. Now I'm going to draw a hand. You know what? I'm going to put the anchor point at the shoulder where it would be. Hold down command to snap it. Okay. Now my arm's all set. So if I rotate it, it's going to rotate like an arm would at the body. Now I'm going to draw a hand. Let's go do a quick cartoony mitten to save time. That round join is important because it'll help keep it with the uh, It'll hide any uh, hard edges that I don't want. So that's my hand. And we'll give it a fill instead of a stroke. I'll even change the color of it too. Okay. My arm. I'm going to give that expression to with the nulls. So I need to click on the word path for it to work. There we go. I'm going to go window, create nulls from paths. Click there. Points follow nulls. Yes. So it helped to name them. This one's the wrist. This one's the elbow. This one's the shoulder. All right, great. Let's move the wrist. My hand, I will parent to the wrist null. So now, look at this. Arm moves the way it would, but in addition to position, I've got rotation. Now you can see the hand will rotate with the null. This is something similar to what Sarah did with her headphone cable. And it's a good way of quickly rigging together a character if you need to keep the hands following the body. This is the way to do it with nulls. And uh, you just move the different nulls as you need to to get the look you want. And remember, with After Effects, anything with a stopwatch, you can animate over time. You just need a minimum of at least two keyframes. Go check my mail, see if anybody else has anything yet. Nope, okay. And we'll be getting to all this stuff throughout the semester, but it's a good idea to always introduce it to you early so that you get a glimpse of the things you can do and try and find ways that'll save you time and the animation workflows that you like most. So I'm going to send this to the class after I'm done the stream. Again, just a reminder, no matter what you're doing, think about what you want to do, then try and figure out how you want to do it. I wanted to make a train, so I knew the parts I needed. Then I had to set up the anchor points for each layer so that it moves the way that I want to. The anchor point influences the animation. Then I move the playhead to where I want to animate my 
stopwatches. And then I clicked on the stopwatches I needed, moved the playhead in time to where I want the changes to end. I added expressions by using the pick whip for that stopwatch, not the pick whip for that layer. And I got something complex with only two keyframes and a lot of parenting and troubleshooting ahead of time. Let's push this a little bit more. Now remember, if I've got the number highlighted and I hold down shift and I hit the up and down arrows, I can quickly find the font size that I want. And with the selection arrow, I can use my arrow keys on my keyboard to set this up how I want. So I'm going to parent the word train to the train body so that as the train moves, we've got that. Okay, that's fine. Now I'm going to add some texture. So now I'm going to import that texture. I could double click in the empty space of my project panel or go file, import file. Put the texture below the text layer so I can see what I'm doing. Scale it up. Like that. Okay, great. And remember, alpha mats, a mask goes over your face, like a Halloween mask right there. That's on top, so I'm going to use it as my alpha mat. I go to the layer below it, to the track mat, choose alpha mat. So now I've got some nice textured type to go with my text. And that happened. So I'm going to go there and I'm just going to parent the texture to the text. Now it stays. The texture is parented to the text. The text is parented to the train. Parenting matters. You just got to think it through. No matter what you're rigging together, every element needs to be connected if you want the whole thing to stay together. Motion design is 85% mental. You got to do a lot of troubleshooting to get the look you want. Remember, little by little each week, and that's how you get a good project. You can't put it off to the last second. Don't spend most of your time on your artwork because this is motion design, not graphic design. There is graphic design to it, but you're also going to be graded on the quality of your motion, not just the quality of your graphics. And if I wanted to, I could get elements that looked more like a train in the textures and just parent them to the shapes. Same way I did with the text and the texture. And that's some of what we're going to be covering next week as well. Intermediate problem solving with your graphic design and your motion design. All right, I'm going to show you all something and I'll include it in this file. I'll make a new thing. I'll call it beak, like a bird beak. All right. So if I want a triangle, I could draw one or use my star. Let's try that first. So I'm going to change my path points to three, and I've got a triangle. So that's one way of doing it. The other way is with the pen tool. So I'm just going to hold down shift to get a straight line, say about there, and like that. Okay, now that's a triangle. If I want to do a bird beak mouth, it would look better if this were straight, and I'll call this top beak. My anchor point is gonna go in that corner. I hold down command to snap it as I drag. There we go. That's my top beak. I can hit command D to duplicate this. 
saw this one bottom beak and I'll change the color just so that we could uh now remember you gotta be on your selection arrow to change the color and I'll make this just a little bit lighter remember hue will slide you up and down the hue bar saturation will go across I'll desaturate a little bit I'll lighten it a little I'll darken it because it's below it there we go all right so my bottom beak, let me move this, and let's try scale, non-uniform, on the Y, minus 100. That, when you do a minus on one axis, it will flip it. So that's there. Now I'm going to hold down shift and click that one path point. So I'm going to just move that up a little bit. All right, let me hit R for rotate. Now I've got a working beak. I can have each of them rotate too, like such. Nod ahead. I'll make it a different color so that everyone can see what's going on. And I'll put the head on top so that no matter how much these rotate, I'm going to keep the head shape. And lastly, I'm going to hit U to hide my layers. I mean my... Uh, I'm going to parent the beak to the head, both pieces. So as the head moves, the beak goes with it. And always think about your anchor points. The anchor point for the head should be at the bottom where it meets the body. Now you got some bobble, the beak follows it. Plus you can also Animate either part of the beak you want. Like that. So I'm going to need to move this in a little bit. It says the beak's closed. Stays with the head. And doesn't leave it. I just zero out my rotation and it's back to where it was, like such. All right, I'm going to check the chat. If no one has anything now, then I'm going to end the stream. Yep, I mean the inbox. Yeah, no one wrote me. All right. Keep working on your stuff little by little so that it doesn't sneak up on you at the last second. That's the way to get a good motion design project done, little by little. Like I said at the beginning of the, of, uh, the semester, the joke I always start the class off with, how to eat an elephant, one bite at a time, little by little, and you can achieve you know, something special. And a big task is always easier when you whittle it down little by little each day, each week. So if you have any questions, contact me. I'll edit up. I'll edit the stream and have it up tomorrow morning or uh, right after this is done, I can send along the link to the unlisted one if you need to review anything. So have a great weekend and I'll see everybody Tuesday.